Casey Michelle is head of the Combating Kleptocracy Programme at the Human Rights Foundation, focusing on how dictators and autocrats use illicit finance and dirty money to remain in power. He's the author of American Kleptocracy on America's transformation into an offshore haven. That could equally uh, be applied to London, and we are going to touch on the topic of London Grad as well in today's episode, as well as many other topics. His new book, Foreign Agents, will examine the explosion of the foreign lobbying industry in Washington and how that industry has helped entrench dictatorships and upend American foreign policy. Casey, it's an absolute delight to welcome you to the channel. Jonathan, thanks so much for having me. Well, foreign agents is a fascinating topic, I think, to start with. Let's start there, because what's happening in Georgia uh, is absolutely symptomatic of where the concept of foreign agents is used for authoritarian entrenchment. But also the flip side is that using foreign agents in democracies can be a tool to undermine democratic accountability and institutions. Could you sort of unpack the two sides of this and how on earth we deal with it? Yeah, absolutely, Jonathan. There's a great question and certainly extremely topical given everything that's been going on in Georgia and Tbilisi and all of these remarkable, brave protests. Certainly Georgians are no strangers to protests over the past few decades. This is the latest iteration, but it is remarkable to see. And beyond that, remarkable to see that it is predicated on this foreign agents legislation that the ruling Georgian Dream Party is trying to pass and implement that would effectively allow them to target any and all organizations, any and all individuals that receive any funding from abroad, regardless of what role that funding may play in their advocacy. And again, these are non-governmental pro-democracy organizations that the ruling increasingly pro-Russian government in Georgia is attempting to use. And then obviously beyond that, folks may remember a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago or so at this point, Russia passed similar legislation uh, allowing the Russian government to do the exact same thing, that is to say, target and uh, in some cases, uh, arrest and uh, and jail uh, those that they accuse of being foreign agents, those they accuse of receiving funds from abroad to, uh, as the Kremlin would see it, undermine Vladimir Putin and undermine his regime itself. Um, that's one element of modern foreign agent legislation. What I am writing about in this forthcoming book uh, is the flip side of that. And that is the usage of foreign agent related legislation and regulations in not autocracies or budding autocracies, but in democracies themselves. Uh, as you and folks may uh, be able to tell from my thick American accent, I am an American writer, an American journalist. This forthcoming book is called Foreign Agents, How American Lobbyists and Lawmakers Threaten Democracy Around the World. It is primarily about the American foreign lobbying industry. That is to say the Americans, those PR firms and lawyers, those former American officials and think tanks that act as uh, mouthpieces for, and in many cases, foot soldiers of foreign governments, foreign regimes, and especially foreign dictatorships. The name of the book, um, and this is maybe getting a little too into the weeds right now, but the name of the book stems from one specific piece of legislation in the United States. That is the Foreign Agents Registration Act, which was a piece of legislation that I detail in the book, was formed not recently, but almost a century ago in the 1930s, when American legislators first realized that fascists abroad were targeting and manipulating Americans with fascist propaganda, especially by using Americans on the ground to peddle pro-Hitler uh, and pro-Mussolini rhetoric. Uh, in 1938, the U.S. passed the Foreign Agents Registration Act, which did not make that illegal. It didn't mean that it was illegal for Americans to work on behalf of or act as mouthpieces or lobbyists on behalf of these foreign regimes. They simply had to register their work, disclose what they were doing, and disclose how much they were being paid to do so to the uh, American authorities and to the American public. That is the first iteration of anything we've ever seen related to foreign agents and foreign agents legislation. It has been nearly a century. We've seen, again, many manifestations of that being used by malign actors in places like Russia and Georgia. But in the United States of America, it has been extremely effective in recent years in targeting those Americans that had been working as mouthpieces and lobbyists for foreign dictatorships without actually disclosing anything of what they were doing. And this is... An absolutely fascinating area because, you know, I don't want to get your eyes sued, but someone like Paul Manafort, um, very obviously working as a foreign agent, um, 
to you know manipulate the political system but also uh you know you could class him as a political technologist someone helping foreign regimes on behalf of moscow to increase illiberal authoritarian uh, sort of control and penetration of those systems um this is fascinating isn't it because as we uncover more of the story about how putinism came about we do see uh, American lobbyists, and we do see political technologists working with Yeltsin to subvert and in some ways crush the nascent democracy in Russia. Now, I, I, I'm not under the illusion that Russia ever had a democracy, or that may never have actually had a chance of blossoming. But this idea of sort of foreign agents is, is it goes quite deep, doesn't it? Absolutely. And again, Jonathan, I mean, you, you were there front and center in Russia in the 1990s to witness this firsthand. So certainly you're not speaking out of turn whatsoever. You know, there are, you mentioned a name a moment ago, Paul Manafort. Folks may be best familiar with him or most familiar with him from his work as Donald Trump's uh, 2016 campaign manager. He was the uh, head of the campaign that initially launched Trump to power in 2016. He is one of the key figures in my forthcoming book. I'm not spoiling anything by saying his story uh, is one of the primary elements of the narrative spine of the book. And as I argue in the introduction and throughout much of the book, his story is absolutely key to understanding not only the threat that these foreign agents pose to democracies, nascent democracies and democratizing forces abroad, whether it's in Russia in the 1990s or in places like Ukraine and elsewhere. Certainly Paul Manafort has worked for any number of governments, any number of regimes from Nigeria to the Philippines, as well as in the post-Soviet space. But these figures do not threaten democracy only in those countries in which they are operating, but in recent years, increasingly threatening democracy in the United States of America. And again, Paul Manafort playing a key role within this. You know, there was a reason that I've written this book now. This, this book could not have been written 10 years ago, even though the Foreign Agents Registration Act was, was passed in the 1930s. And even though the foreign lobbying industry has existed for decades and exploding, especially in the early 21st century, it was only thanks to the rise of figures like Donald Trump to say nothing of what the Putins of the world were doing on the broader geopolitical stage and how they were using and abusing American foreign lobbying services to infiltrate to influence democracies elsewhere, including in the United States. This is all something that really came to a head only since 2016. And it's only now that I've been able to write the book because of certain court proceedings, because of certain uh, documentary uh, filings, certainly some of the folks that I have spoken to finally willing to come on the record and share their stories. Uh, this is something that has been threatening democracies for years, but it's only in the past few years that folks, whether in the United States or elsewhere, have finally realized just what a threat this entire industry poses to the rest of us. And looking at the flip side of that, where foreign money is supporting civil society organizations, and you have the flip side of that, which is taking the principle of the foreign agents law that uh, a register that was created in the US, and then saying, actually, you know, this is good. this is great because one, we can sort of expose uh, foreign finance, but in autocracies, it's then used to persecute those organizations and drive them underground or or jail them or whatever. Um, we see this playing out in Georgia very publicly, although the media coverage is not nearly as uh, extensive as, as as perhaps we would like. Um, similarly with Maidan, perhaps misunderstood at the time and not covered in, in enough depth. Um, but we see foreign agents laws popping up all over the place and 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 again not a huge amount of coverage so i, I read something today about turkey uh, potentially introducing its own foreign agent laws we have central asia many of the countries across central asia have also taken their cue either learning from other autocrats or coming under pressure from moscow to introduce these iran as well very much modeled its legislation on the russian template yeah, you're you're absolutely right. 
Jonathan, we have seen those countries without independent judiciaries, those that are closely allied with Russia or other uh, increasingly despotic regimes implement their own versions of this. I'm not at all surprised to see the government in Turkey considering something similar. And I won't be surprised when we see news from the governments in places like Uzbekistan or even further afield, perhaps places like Vietnam, um, uh, 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 perhaps even places like India at some point down the line, considering similar legislation to this, because they have unfortunately, again, seen the efficacy of things like this in Russia um, uh, and elsewhere, uh, certainly in Georgia, uh, as a case in point of using foreign agent related legislation to target and to upend it, in some cases, jail these democratic figures. None of that, I think, detracts from the necessity of legislation like this in democracies and even beyond that, the successes that we have seen in places like the United States of America. And again, not every Western jurisdiction, not every democratic jurisdiction has seen similar legislation to this, similar requirements to what we see in the United States with this Foreign Agents Registration Act. Um, thankfully, it exists in the United States of America because it is not only something that provides exceptional transparency for what these lobbying networks that are working on behalf of foreign dictatorships, whether it's in Moscow or in Kazakhstan or Azerbaijan or elsewhere are doing, uh, but because of additionally the magnitude and the size and the scope and the scale of the American lobbying industry writ large. It is now a multi-billion dollar industry um, that brings in money again from around the world, from regimes around the world, hiring those PR companies, those law firms, those consultancies, and increasingly donating to things like think tanks and universities with the express, express reason of uh, influencing and lobbying uh, sitting legislators and beyond that laundering the images of these foreign regimes uh, themselves. The Foreign Agents Registration Act, again, which is one of the, the through lines. Again, it's not a person, it's not a figure, it, it's a piece of legislation whose story I try to tell within this book itself has been an exceptional boon to understanding how it is these foreign regimes, these foreign dictatorships target and manipulate, in this case, Americans. But again, these are transnational networks. These are dictatorships learning from one another which techniques uh, are most effective, which firms are most worth uh, of their investments, and beyond that, which uh, elements of messaging uh, and which areas of the broader American politi body politic to target are the most effective. Um, the Foreign Agents Registration Act has been an unprecedented, in many ways unparalleled uh, reality uh, and a tool for transparency and understanding these networks. And again, unfortunately, those foreign dictatorships have realized you can flip it on its head and use it for purely mal malign purposes as well. And if you drive the money out of the lobbying, or at least you shine a spotlight on it uh, so that people know who's being paid for what, we see that Russia is a little bit like uh, it's a little bit like a hot gas. You know, if it if it finds a hard barrier, it can't penetrate. It will just keep looking for those little chinks that it can get through. So let's assume this this kind of works. Russia has plenty of other tools, and prior to the full scale invasion, it used a whole series of informal networks, uh, investment vehicles, and especially. I think what you've described in your book, kleptocratic networks and kleptocratic influence, including the Russian diaspora, but also things like London Grand, you know, vast, vast sums of money, which have um, political influence at their heart, but which goes unseen. How how has that worked? And how is that still a threat? And not just from Russia, places like China and various other autocratic regimes. If there is a theme or thematic element connecting these two books that I have now written, Jonathan, and this is something we were talking about a bit earlier, it is that we in the West, in the UK, in the US and elsewhere, left ourselves wide open to these networks of influence, of infiltration, of illicit finance uh, for years, for much, if not most, of the post-Cold War period. And that stems from many reasons, with many figures, many realities, certainly many forces at play, and of course, many regimes taking part as well. But one element that has certainly come to the fore on my end is that it was not due to, you know, this, this openness, this inability to turn away, whether it is the Russian financing, the Russian influence efforts, let alone to uncover, let alone to stanch and stop them. It was not necessarily because of a lack of policies, it was because many, if not most, of the policies within this space were simply being ignored, overlooked, and unenforced 
or had seen such significant loophole carve outs that they were effectively uh, not worth the paper on which they were written. Uh, whether that is in terms of the malign finance space and the allowance of the, the perfectly free and easy allowance of the creation of shell companies in American states like Delaware, Nevada, Wyoming, or the loopholes on um, uh, basic due diligence and anti-money laundering requirements for American real estate, American private equity investments, American hedge fund investments. Again, all of these major capital markets that we know have been and continue to be in many cases targeted by illicit kleptocratic oligarchic financial networks. Um, nonetheless, for decades, it was perfectly legal to use those as anonymizing vehicles as laundering vehicles in the United States of America. There were no crimes being committed because of these loopholes at play. And to bring things back to lobbying right now, even though we've had the Foreign Agents Registration Act on the books since the 1930s, it was effectively unenforced for almost three quarters of a century, in many ways, until 2016 and the late 2010s. So in a certain sense, it's almost completely unsurprising that these autocratic regimes, and many times led by Russia, but certainly by no means limited to Putin, we're using and abusing these openings, these loopholes, these industries, and in, this, in, in many cases, these Americans on the ground to do their dirty work, tilt policy their way, all while doing it outside of the public eye. And unfortunately, in many cases, with investigators completely asleep at the wheel. And again, we all see what this has ended up in, whether it is the conflagration and devastation in Ukraine and the national security concerns for Ukraine, as well as Europe itself, to say nothing of what the Irans or the Venezuelas, or especially the Chinas of the world now present. They have feasted for years on the openness of Western economies, Western lobbying networks, and Western legislators to effectively do their bidding without the rest of us realizing anything what was going on. And we were very much playing catch up. And I, I don't want to be too depressing, but I certainly hope it's not too late. And people tend to silo these things, don't they? They look at the economy and say, well, that money over here has nothing to do with foreign policy. Sport has nothing to do with foreign policy. Uh, literature, culture has nothing to do with foreign policy. That, I would argue, is not how Russia thinks and works. Everything is a weapon. So are we are we wising up to that or are we still acting in quite a siloed fashion? I, I certainly think we are wising up to it insofar as we have, again, been playing catch up for years at this point. This is, is years, perhaps decades too late. Um, it's difficult to think that we could be getting more ignorant about the threats of this because we had been so ignorant about it for years and for decades. So certainly in that sense, we are playing catch up, but there's still much, much work remaining. I mean, again, I am similar to how it was with my first book, which examined the American transformation into the center of offshore finance and illicit money laundering. I, I am still surprised many times over that I have somehow been the person to write the book on the American foreign lobbying industry, even though all of this information was available for years and things like the Foreign Agents Registration Act database. Um, it, it is, it is. look, I'm happy to be the one to do so, but I, I, I do wish I hadn't been, and I do wish folks had been paying far more attention to this far, uh, far earlier. But I think you're exactly right, Jonathan, that these investments, these infiltration networks, these influence networks are not siloed. They do not exist in a vacuum. And maybe they are not being weaponized at a certain time and a certain place in conjunction with one another, but they are simply waiting to be activated if they haven't been already, whether it is the major sports investments, whether it's the major media purchases of uh, um, uh, uh, you know major newspapers or television stations, whether it is, uh, again, the kind of secretive investments in, for instance, luxury real estate properties connected to or overseen by um, figures like Donald Trump, who again, emerged from one of the key industries that soaked up so much and beyond that laundered so much of the illicit finance coming from places like Russia, as well as a number of other autocratic regimes. You know, these are investments that may not have immediate dividends, but for those in the Kremlin, they certainly have an idea of what the long game presents and all of these openings or uh, again, you know, perfect openings for them to activate at some point to destabilize democracies and push back American or broader Western interests as well. I think uh, similarly in the UK, Oliver Buller would very much like to be part of a cohort of authors tackling this, but again, finds himself as a relatively lone voice tackling this same topic you described there. Let's sort of turn to Russia, because this is going to be an episode in, in two halves. You know, we, we, we've talked about that sort of use of networks uh, for both, I would say, the good and the bad. 
let's turn to Russia, because you've written extensively about Russia's um, authoritarian slide. You've written about the roots of that authoritarianism, where it gets its, uh, I don't want to say it's a, it, it's a fairly fragmented philosophy, but it does have some intellectual roots behind it. It's, it's revanchist fascism. Um, and you've also written very compellingly about where it comes next. So let's sort of let's turn to that. Let's tackle the roots, starting with uh, the sort of white emigre fascist philosopher such as uh, Ivan Ilin, um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. You've written about how do these provide some legitimacy or foundation for Putin's regime? Sure. And Jonathan, this, this is maybe where I would turn to you for some questions from your own personal experience. I, I have no doubt that, again, when you were living in St. Petersburg in the 1990s, you were exposed to a handful, maybe many, conversations about what Russian nationalism was, what it entailed, and beyond that, what a potential future for a resurgent and especially revanchist Russia may uh, may mean. I, I don't know um, if you had conversations about figures like Ilin or Alexander Solzhenitsyn specifically, but uh, you know, for, for brief context, Ivan Ilin was a white emigre. He was a political philosopher who uh, fled the Russian Civil War uh, uh, to Europe, spent much of his time uh, in Berlin. He is perhaps best known if he is uh, known in the West. He's certainly known in Russia uh, as well, and especially by Vladimir Putin, who considers him his kind of go-to, perhaps even favorite philosopher. He is known for writing about Russia as this supposedly organic whole where there is no independent Ukraine, certainly no independent Belarus, not even necessarily independent Central Asian states. There is only one true whole holistic Russia that needs to be, must be overseen by a single central strongman, a single central figure who perhaps holds votes, perhaps nods to democracy. But at the end of the day, democracy is not something that Russia should have, not something Russia needs. Those votes are simply affirmation of the supreme uh, leader's ideal. Certainly, this is something Vladimir Putin has implemented for decades at this point. It remains unclear and for future historians to see when and how he discovered Eileen. Was this an inspiration or is this something that was simply post hoc? Um, wh what is perhaps most surprising for me and, and perhaps other listeners as well is that figures like Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who again is this, you know, he's a Nobel Prize winner. He's an incredibly well-known figure in, in many ways as um, uh, you know the, the editor-in-chief of The New Yorker described him, one of, if not the most dominant writers of the 20th century. And certainly I've read plenty of his work. I'm, I'm sure, Jonathan, you're perfectly familiar with things like Gulag Archipelago, Cancer War, A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, so on and so forth. A lot of folks still remember him, rightly so, as this anti-Soviet crusader. A lot of folks are unfortunately not aware that in the late 1980s and early 1990s, he was also writing uh, treatises, manifestos, short books, describing how it is that Russia needs to reincorporate uh, not only um, parts of northern Kazakhstan or uh, Belarus that are uh, populated by predominantly Slavic populations, but especially Ukraine. And any notion of an independent Ukraine is anathema to the broader project of uh, Russia itself, as uh, Solzhenitsyn described it, uh, the Russian Union. Now, again, these are the kind of philosophical parameters or paradigms that very well-known figures in Russia, like Ilin and Solzhenitsyn, were describing in the early to mid 20th century, in the late 20th century, and certainly that we have seen figures like Putin implementing, attempting to implement, uh, in the 21st century. And unfortunately, so many of us in the West were ignorant of or decided simply to ignore those writings. And beyond that, the clear signs of revanchist imperialism, as, as you mentioned a moment ago, revanchist fascism, you know, I, I, it's early days yet, but I, I have I've been toying around with another potential book idea, looking specifically at policy decisions uh, that the West took, especially the United States of America took in the early 1990s, vis-a-vis -vis Russia, uh, as well as Ukraine, Belarus and Kazakhstan in terms of denuclearization, in terms of looking the other way for even I mean, again, this is pre-Putin, but Yeltsin's. Uh, armed interventionism in places like Moldova and Georgia, again, all of these elements that without putting too much emphasis on hindsight and certainly there's no real inevitability there's all it's you know it's all incredibly tangential and certainly predicated on specific decisions but you can see the building blocks you can see the trajectory that putin would later build upon and beyond that why putin would believe perfectly understandably that the west would look the other way would wilt in the face of russian imperialism and will be more than happy at the end of the day to take Russian finance, Russian money, to do the Kremlin's bidding. 
And in some ways, to relate this to current policy and to be perhaps uh, controversial, or perhaps not, depends on your point of view, it seems that the idea of Russia disintegrating, the idea of Russia ceasing to be an empire, exercises minds more in Washington, Berlin, than the idea of Ukrainian victory. And I find that obscene and misguided, but it does seem that there is something there and it goes back to obviously the famous Bush chicken Kiev kind of speech again, where, you know, this concern to hold the Soviet Union together, which seems absurd now, given subsequent events. In many ways, this is a story we have seen before. Um, I just recently finished an essay on the broader century long history of uh, U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis not Moscow, but uh, Ukraine through the late czarist era, through the Soviet era and obviously through the uh, post-Cold War era. And this theme continuing to emerge, I know we just mentioned, you know, George H.W. Bush a moment ago in his infamous 1991 speech uh, in Kiev to the Ukrainian legislators at the time, tamping down on Ukrainian nationalism, as he described it, suicidal nationalism, attempting to uh, restore and reassure the Soviet Union and in so doing prevent the dissolution of the Soviet Union itself. What was fascinating to me is that was a theme that American legislators had pursued for, I mean, frankly, for about a century at that point, or at least since the 1910s of the Woodrow Wilson administration, when Ukrainians during the czarist collapse came to Washington or were speaking to uh, uh, Western policymakers during the uh, 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 negotiations in Paris following the end of World War I, saying, we have now declared an independent Ukrainian state. Will you support us? Will you recognize us? And Woodrow Wilson, as well as leaders in France uh, and the UK at the time, saying, no, we have no desire, no interest to do so whatsoever. And obviously, fast forward to 1991, H.W. Bush. Now, now, thankfully, the Ukrainians paid him no mind and, of course, declared independence. But that, and again, that that's, that's as Jonathan, you well know, you've been having conversations on this for, for years at this point, following it day in, day out. What I have done a little bit of writing on in recent months, because you're exactly right, few things seem to, frankly, frighten policymakers in Washington more than the potential, whether it's breakup or erosion or dissolution or fracturing, whatever term you'd like to use, of the current federation. Um, and again, I, th there are certainly understandable elements, concerns about nuclear uh, uh, missiles um, uh, uh, be being loosed or being lost, uh, concerns about other forms of weaponry in the Russian Federation, to say nothing of potential refugee crises, economic knock-on offense, so on, so on and so forth. You know, I, I, what I've been trying to do in my writings on this, not to predict that it will necessarily happen, but to familiarize or maybe re-familiarize folks in Washington and elsewhere that the current Rus Russian Federation is by no means any kind of homogenous structure, uh, in many ways similar to the Soviet Union and the Tsarist Empire before it. It is a composite structure that is a direct legacy of um, Tsarist era as well as Soviet era, and, and now unfortunately Putin era, expansionism and imperialism, and includes many nations, many polities that... Frankly, at the end of the day, I, I suspect many Russians would not necessarily consider part of the homeland. I think maybe folks are familiar with the history of Chechnya and the Chechen wars in the 1990s, but this extends to things like Yakutia and Tatarstan, even places like Karelia, which have uh, certainly not been Russian holdings since uh, you know the, the earliest czar, uh, 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 earliest czars themselves but are internal colonies that have their own distinct histories. And certainly as I have been finding as well, and again, Jonathan, maybe you remember this in the 1990s, um, declared sovereignty themselves, if not outright independence, which of course Putin has later completely trampled upon. Yeah, some areas have semi-autonomy, some don't. It seems quite sort of capricious in some ways, and it depends on whether the leader is is clever enough in these regions or, or has the intent to um, cut out to Moscow, but introduce some kind of autonomy locally. It's, it's a patchwork, absolutely. Um, but even the idea, which is often touted of, as Chechnya being the first to break away, that seems perhaps not as likely given the entrenchment of the security services and, you know, the effort that, that's that gone into, to uh, you know, really both utilising and dominating that territory. But as you say, I don't think people realise how perhaps brittle and artificial some of this structure is and how it's built on, on internal colonisation. You've produced a fascinating article that actually gives some probabilities against certain outcomes. And actually, you wrote this before Shoigu was dismissed, uh, but you gave one of the 
highest ratings to the idea of actually Putin retrenching his power, retaining control, but perhaps moving in the sort of more technocratic direction. And of course, he has just appointed an economist uh, to the crucial, um, uh, you know, uh, head of the the sort of defense ministry. Mm -hmm. Arguably, defense ministry is the second most powerful job in the country in in wartime. So is your prediction sort of coming coming to pass, as it were? (laughs) I, 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 I'm perfectly happy to take credit for any form of accuracy in anything that I write, Jonathan, but far be it for me to take any credit for any uh, decision, certainly that Putin has made. What, what I attempted to do, and again, is, as you, uh, you know, uh, graciously mentioned, is outline a number of potential scenarios um, ranging from the least likely, unfortunately, full and uh, free and fair democracy developing in Moscow and throughout the entire Russian Federation, to uh, the most likely, and again, this is this is within the next maybe five six years by the end of Putin's next term by 2030, and unfortunately, that is simply him retaining power, and in many ways, not seeing much change, whether on the ground in places like Ukraine, let alone to his um, regime in in Russia itself. It was fascinating to see the decision come out of the Kremlin to replace uh, former Defense Minister Shoigu. Again, I think it is a testament to just how little information. We do have on some of these decisions and what will be uh, for future historians to understand. I think what is fascinating, certainly on my end, and this it's too early to see what the ramifications and reverberations of this will be, um, to bring things back to what we were talking about a moment ago, um, Defense Minister Shoigu, again, he's still, still considered part of Putin's inner circle. He is half Russian, half Tuvan. Uh, Tuva being a, a small uh, a nation uh, in um, central Siberia um, and uh, again was was independent through the Second World War and later annexed by the, the Soviet Union. You know, Shoigu is very much a, the pride of Tuva itself. And what I will be fascinated to watch is to see if there are any forms of whether it's protest, whether it's discontent, whether it's potentially more emerge in Tuva. And, and the, the reason I say that is not simply because he is ethnic Tuvan or half ethnic Tuvan, but because, again, these are moments that a lot of us either overlooked or forgotten. In the early 1990s, during the Soviet disintegration, there were anti-Russian riots, what effectively became pogroms against Russian settlers, Russian colonizers, those Russians living in the region by Tuvans and by Tuvan forces. Now, of course, we have seen things stabilized, to use a term, uh, since then, but that is within living memory of many of those who are still in Tuva, certainly many of those who are in Moscow itself. So anyways, one more thing to watch. Um, again, I don't know what's going to happen. None of us know what's going to happen in terms of uh, a Moscow, Tuva, or elsewhere in the Russian Federation. But the more we can consider, play around with, understand the implications of potential decisions and potential outcomes, the better off we're all going to be. And something else you must you know, observe with your, your, your deep sort of knowledge of the region is that in much of the mainstream media and I would say sort of amateur pundits, you often get some fairly wrong-headed takes. This also includes, I have to say, you know, a lot of uh, Russian oppositional journalists who will get stuff wrong over and over and over again, um, even about their own society. And, and arguably Prigozhin simply failed to understand the mechanics of uh, the power structure that exists there um, in, in, in um, not following through on his, his coup. Uh, but one of the inter- immediate interpretations, of course, is the dismissal of Shoigu is that, ah, well, he stole too much or it's a corruption thing, which to me is is laughable because the, the entire system is, uh, you know, there is no corruption in Russia because essentially that is the system. It's if everyone is corrupt, then no one is uh-huh. corrupt, of course. But here's the interesting thing about the dismissal. It's not just Shoigu, it's Patrushev. And Patrushev is, if anything, an ideologue, a believer so by removing these two people and putting a technocrat in charge, there's three things potentially that are happening. And I, the question is going to be, you know, where it goes from here. But it would seem that in removing someone who is ideologically committed to the war in Ukraine, you are potentially opening the door to ending that, to accepting it's not worked and trying to move somewhere else. Get the ideologues, remove their power. That, that That's an opening for you. Equally, you've got a technocrat who could help you to win the marathon rather than the sprint. So that opens the door to you continuing the war forever. Um, 
And the move also would seem to perhaps retrench your power, which speaks to a certain sort of paranoia about, uh, you know, rivals or coups or whatever. Um, so is it possible that Putin doesn't know which way he's going to go in, but this decision he's made allows for several different avenues? I do think it's a great question, Jonathan. And again, we'll we'll see what uh, you know time has in store for us. But in terms of leaving potential openings and avenues open, certainly this is what Putin has been doing at least since he realized the failure of his march on Kiev. Um, I mean, frankly, this is what he's been doing in terms of foreign policy, at least since the mid two thousands. Whether it is uh, you know regarding uh, relations with Transnistria and Moldova, using Transnistria as a potential lever. Uh, to control Moldovan foreign policy. Similarly, in Georgia with Abkhazia and South Ossetia, of course, in Ukraine with Crimea in, in 2014, and uh, using the fighting in eastern Ukraine as leverage on Kiev's foreign policy after 2014. And then, of course, some of the decisions that he's made since 2022. I would love, uh, of all the potential avenues moving forward, love to think that there has been some kind of realization on Putin's end that this war is, if not necessarily a failure in so far as toppling Kiev, certainly not as successful as Putin has wished, even though he continues to occupy more territory than he did in February 2022. Uh, I would like to think that he has had some form of come to Jesus moment, some form of reality sinking in that this is a morass, this is a quagmire. And even though there are those in the West, especially in the United States of America, that would like to gut support for or walk away from uh, Ukraine, that is no by no means a guarantee whatsoever. Uh, I would love to think that there is some form of realization seeping in in the Kremlin on those realities. Unfortunately, I suspect it was, uh, I believe, your second scenario of Putin perhaps shuffling the deck chairs, but attempting to find a way to use the economic know-how within his inner circle or expanded circle to assure himself and assure the broader populace that this war is economically feasible. Uh, Even though the sanctions that have been implemented over the last few years still have plenty of holes, we've certainly seen uh, plenty of need for secondary sanctions on continuing Russian partners and, and um, those uh, uh, third party uh, uh, actors uh, re-importing into Russia or re-exporting into Russia. Uh, even though those sanctions have not, to use a term, brought Russia to its knees, uh, we have increasingly seen signs that the Russian economy is turning, frankly, into a hothouse. The concerns about inflation have not gone anywhere. And if anything, will only continue, would only accelerate as the Russian government continues to pump, especially the defense manufacturing base, with rubles uh, that, again, drive up the price of labor uh, and that trickle out into the broader Russian economy itself and drive up prices for everyone else in the Russian Federation. You know, these things cannot last forever. Um, And even though things like the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan lasted for 10 years, and of course, we're only two years into this expanded invasion, There is some form of economic end date to this in which the Russian populace will refuse to go along. Now, we're certainly not there yet, but I think even Putin realizes that as the Russian economy continues to turn into this hothouse, there is little reason to think that there will be some kind of restoration of solid economic footing. And again, the the appointment of an economist of all people to a uh, you know the top position in the defense ministry ministry, I suspect, indicates that decision. But again, I I unfortunately am just as in the dark as everyone else. Another argument that would work in favor of what you just said there is the hope that Trump will win the presidency, and I would say by extension the hope that. He would make decisions favorable to the Kremlin. Well, neither of those are givens. But where do you think this forms as part of Putin's calculus? And what are the risks of a Trump presidency? Is he likely to follow the sort of Manafort predicted route or those predicted, if you're a Democrat, certainly of being anti-Ukraine and throwing Ukraine under the bus? Or, Or could it be very different? I would love to think it would be very different. I suspect, and I've written on this over the past few months as well, that a Trump presidency is not only something that Putin is counting on or banking on or certainly hoping for insofar as what the effect on American policy vis-a-vis Ukraine would be, but I suspect that Trump would um, effectively throw Ukraine to the wolves. You know, he has said in the past that he would solve the war, quote unquote, solve the war within 24 hours. Uh, His advisors uh, have uh, indicated, uh, and even folks like Prime Minister Viktor Orban in Hungary after a meeting, 
with Trump himself have indicated that that means turning off the tap of funding for Ukraine and even potentially going so far as forcing Ukraine to cede, formally cede, uh, Crimea as well as the Donbass to Russia. Now, I suspect Trump isn't aware that at this point, Putin has claimed far more than just the Donbass, including places like uh, uh, Zaporizhia, um, again, additional provinces and additional land that Russian troops have still not been able to conquer. But an American decision, a decision out of Washington to walk away from Ukraine would be uh, devastating, not only for Ukrainians on the ground, but for the broader European security ar architecture and eventually uh, American national security writ large. Um, consigning Ukraine to be a, a vassal state of uh, Russia itself would not only allow the Russian Federation to feast upon all of Ukraine's economic resources, but would effectively allow Russia to absorb Ukraine's uh, military structures, existing military structures themselves, and uh, buttress uh, Russian armed forces, forces that much more. Obviously, they've been decimated over the past few years, but in terms of the uh, scheduling for rebuild, that would put that on jet fuel and return Russia to what I certainly believe Putin wants at the end of the day, which is to be the premier uh, security power uh, and armed power on the continent in, uh, in Europe, eventually to see the uh, overall um, uh, retrenchment of the United States of America, if not from the entirety of uh, Europe, then at least from those post-1991 uh, expansions in places like Central and Eastern Europe. A, a Trump administration, I suspect, would be a significant step forward for all of those gains uh, and goals out of the Kremlin. And of course, those who incline to a more pessimistic point of view, as unfortunately I do, would say that this would also place the Baltics in danger. There is the question mark as to whether Article 5 would be activated uh, by the full alliance um, to protect the Baltics. And if they were overrun within days and they're a done deal, do, do you go and reconquer them? I mean, that's a difficult issue. But even if we put Article 5 countries to one side... Uh, Central Asia would make incredibly rich pickings. Um, it's very doubtful whether any Western power would put boots on the ground to retake Central Asian territory or even Moldova for that instance. I, um, you know, John, my introduction to the the, the, the region uh, was I was a uh, I was a Peace Corps volunteer. I was an English teacher many many years ago when I was far younger and far more well rested than I am now. Uh, in uh, northern Kazakhstan, in a small village uh, in northern Kazakhstan, uh, not far from the, the Kazakh-Russian border. And I had a wonderful time. I, I made some wonderful friends. And what was remarkable to me at the time was by 2014, and again, many of my friends were Russian, many of those were ethnic Kazakh. It was about a 50-50 uh, demographic split in the village in which I lived. What was remarkable to me at the time shortly thereafter, in 2014, following the initial incursion into uh, Ukraine, was the split in reactions from, and without stereotyping, I certainly don't want to go down that road, but the predominance of those friends of mine that were of Russian descent were fully and freely in support of Putin's expansionism and his imperialism, whereas those who were not of um, uh, Russian heritage were uh, far more reticent to express certainly any support, um, not necessarily opposition insofar as they didn't want to be full-throatedly coming to the support of the Ukrainians at the time, but it was a very clear dividing line. What I realized was that the legacies of Russian imperialism, even in a region like northern Kazakhstan, which no policymakers in Washington are thinking about, is as deep and as well-trod and as concerning as those in Ukraine or to pick another uh, country, Belarus themselves. You know, I, I mentioned a moment ago, or we talked a moment ago about Alexander Solzhenitsyn and of course his writings on Ukraine as, as Ukraine being a, a, a proper part of his Russian union. But he also extended that to Northern Kazakhstan as well saying this should be, and if he gets his wishes will be part of Russia once more. And I have no doubt in my mind that Vladimir Putin has every design once he is done with Ukraine on that region of Kazakhstan, maybe not Kazakhstan as a whole, but in terms of shattering that country and annexing those regions he views as properly and historically Russian, I have no doubt that will be next on the chopping block as he recreates this uh, neo-imperialist Russian empire of the 21st century. And here's here's the last question, which really you know comes off the back of that. Um, this episode is going out on Friday. 
the episode that precedes it is on Russian imperialism. So they it, it, they form quite a, uh, let's say, a sort of symbiotic kind of pair of, of episodes there. The last question is, because I think, as you and I have, have, have come to understand this desire for imperial uh, expansion uh, sits in the minds of so many Russians. I can't say it's a majority, but it sits very deeply. What are the chances of this situation being unwound? And I would say sort of uh, what verges on a kind of cult mentality combined with this traditional uh, sort of lust for Im imperial glory, um, what are the chances of, of, of this actually kind of receding uh, over generations as they did with the British Empire? It seems to me they're actually very low and it's going to take something rather more um, serious so, uh, intervention to, to roll it back. It's a fantastic question, um, uh, Jonathan. I, one of the, again, kind of through lines or themes of some of my recent writing, uh, focusing on Russian colonialism and those colonized nations still considered part of the Russian Federation, is attempting to, and I don't know how successful I've been this uh, in, in this, reframe or re-understand um, certainly czarist era Russia, but increasingly Putin era Russia as well, as part and parcel of broader European expansionism and colonialism of the 17th, 18th, 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, and even though that empire was not overseas, uh, it was over land, it was still part of the broader European colonizing project itself. And of course, I would also extend the American expansionism of the 19th century within that as well, which has been another uh, element of my writing and certainly interest uh, uh, as well. And understanding if we are to proceed with this as a potential framing for Russia and Russian expansionism and colonialism, also understanding what the success of colonial or I suppose anti-colonial wars and wars for independence have had on those previously colonizing powers. Whether that was um, certainly the, the Irish with uh, the United Kingdom or to a lesser extent, the Indians with the United Kingdom, whether it was the Algerians and the Vietnamese um, with the, uh, the French, those in Mozambique or Angola with the Portuguese or certainly those throughout South America and even places like Equatorial Guinea with the Spanish. Um, it is not a direct line, but what we have seen broadly thematically uh, throughout history is that for every success of a colonized nation standing up, asserting its independence and forcing out the colonizers, there have been knock on in many cases, though not always democratic effects on those in the colonizing polity, whether it's the United Kingdom, France, Spain, and Portugal. Now, again, some in some cases, this takes decades. Of course, Spain and Portugal only emerged from fascist authoritarian regimes in the 1970s. This is not going to happen overnight. But I, I, I suspect, I, I hope, that the success of the Ukrainian war effort will have eventually a successful knock-on effect in Moscow and perhaps throughout the, the Russian Federation as well. Uh, of a sinking in of, if nothing else, this understanding in Russia among Russians that Russia has been as much of a colonizing force as these other European empires. Because again, Jonathan, I'm sure you've had similar conversations with Russians, even to this day, that they don't recognize Russia as a colonizing empire. Russia never had colonies. It only expanded defensively. And all of those, whether they're Ukrainians or Cossacks or Kyrgyz or Georgians or Azeris, or Tatars, or Bashkirs, or uh, Yakuts, they welcomed Russians with open arms. And they are still happy, in many cases, to be part of the Russian Federation. Or if they are Ukrainians, they are simply wayward Russians waiting to return home. Again, this is all part of a far broader historical process that I suspect you and I, unfortunately, for as young and healthy and vibrant as we are, will not live long enough to see. But I do hope that in the long run, we will see these kind of dem democratizing knock-on effects in uh, in Moscow, as well as a full, free, and independent Ukraine standing proud as part of the European family and nations. These are all fairly ubiquitous myths and extensive historical myths. And I started a little notebook back in the 90s because I, I felt that they were extraordinary. You know, we have our own historical mythology in Britain, but I felt that the ones I was hearing in Russia were far more synthetic and far more toxic. Uh, that notebook, unfortunately, is is growing uh, and <laughs> adding pages even 30 years on. But we have Ukrainians, fortunately, and we have you to help us unpick some of those myths. And I think we should be very, very grateful for that. Look, I mean, I think it's, again, 
this is I, I'm I'm very I thought you were going to say you've lost the notebook at some point. So I'm very happy, Jonathan. You still have that. That is going to make such a font, such a resource for when you eventually write your book or your memoirs, especially of your time. You know, again, I, I do think it's worth remembering putting my American hat on that is only within the last generation, maybe since the 1970s, that we have had a full sale reexamination of the legacies, the lineage, and, and the mythology of Manifest Destiny in uh, uh, the United States of America and American colonization and conquest of much of the North American continent to say nothing of overseas territories, places like Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Guam, et cetera, et cetera. It's only within relatively recent American history that there's been that re-examination of what that expansionism and that colonialism meant and beyond that, what those legacies are and how that can impact and impel and uh, compel uh, democratization in the United States of America. So in, in a certain sense, in a certain sense, it's very early days yet for the United States of America. And we're not even there yet for those in Russia and the Russian Federation. But I would like to think that I will at least live long enough to see those early shoots begin to take root in Russia. We can only hope so. Casey, thanks so much for appearing on the channel. It's been a huge, tremendous privilege, incredibly stimulating conversation. And without sort of, you know, stressing this too much, it would be fantastic to have you back on the channel at some future date because there is so much more to discuss there but for now thank you so much thanks so much jonathan it's been fantastic and hopefully i'll be able to read that notebook someday in your book as well <laughs>